So yeah, thanks for the invite. And I guess to, to give you a little bit of a context, um, T Teddy's a pharmacist and uh, a PhD candidate in law. So you know, he's kind of looking at interdisciplinarity from the, the science law perspective. Um, and when Matt, uh, uh, Matt asked if we wanted to come up, I kind of threw out a challenge. So this, this work comes from what Teddy's doing with his PhD, but it's not directly related to it, uh, which means it's something that is, is just starting off. So we're just starting to think through some ideas around uh, biosimilars, and particularly with the theme of today around the, that exchange of information uh, as, as well. Uh, and really what we're, we're going to do is we're going to do a bit of a, a, a tag team um, but essentially a, a, a quick overview of what biosimilars are, what we mean by biosimilar information, and look at the patent dance which is enshrined in US legislation, but in some recent cases in Australia we'll see that there's some similar uh, tones coming out of those cases from, from the federal court uh, as well. And then again, because it's early days, drawing some fairly tentative observations and pointing to some further research or further questions that... Um, that, we, that we have. So I guess by way of introduction, um, I'm sure you've all heard of the, the term the, the patent cliff, but there's a real push at the moment from, from governments around the world to uh, facilitate and encourage biosimilars into, into the market. There's a range of complex uh, reasons why and there's lots of discussion of whether that is um, a justified position and whether it might uh, result in, in lower cost and better access to medicines. But it, I guess what it's referring to is this idea that very soon a lot of these, these drugs that form biosimilars are coming off patent um, and there's this notion that there's going to be this wave of biosimilars coming through the market in, in the short term. And whether that's in the next couple of years or the next five years, um, it's going to raise some really interesting questions around uh, intellectual property law, uh, particularly patents uh, as well. And, and for me as, as an academic, uh, some of the broader questions go to this notion of IP is, you know, is, is valorising different. So we've got novelty in, in patents, we've got originality in copyright, uh, distinctiveness in trademark, uh, and by definition, biosimilars are, are similar. Um, and the other interesting thing is there's a whole stack of scholarship that you're all probably aware of looking at generics um, and how that interacts with the patent system and the challenges and the, the I guess solutions to some of those problems. Uh, and importantly, biosimilars are not the same as generic, so they pose some very different questions, both in terms of uh, incentives and intellectual property law, but also around the regulation uh, of uh, approvals through the TGA in Australia or the FDA in, in the United States. So there's some really broad, broad questions that um, Teddy will sort of draw out uh, through the next couple of years. But I guess what we're focusing on today is the exchange of information uh, and we probably meet it more in a literal sense to, to what Eva was talking about uh, before. But that exchange of information through the, the patent process, uh, and that is effectively what the patent dance is, is trying to do, is, is reduce litigation or, or shore up what might be litigated at some point through the exchange of, of different sorts of information. But really what we're looking at is two questions. So one is how the information is going to be exchanged. But I think as we've done more work here, what's probably more important is what is being exchanged. So when you look at the, the biosimilars and the way in which they're manufactured and developed, uh, it's probably a question of what's being exchanged rather than um, how that, that might occur. So they're the two questions that we're, we're looking at. But before we do any of that, um, I guess we need to have a bit of a understanding of what biosimilars are. So Teddy's going to give us a quick rundown of, of biosimilars as a pharmaceutical. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, my interest is in, in biosimilars as such. Biosimilars only exist because of biologic drugs. Biologic drugs are generally made using a whole lot of different types of biotechnology, but often using genetically modified cells. One of the first ones that came out, or the first group that came out, was insulins. Uh, previous, we used bovine insulin, porcine insulin. Most of our insulins, if not all these days, are recombinant DNA, human insulin. So there's no immunogenicity problems with regards to using a, a, a pig's cells in, in ourselves. Um, the trouble with it is, when you get a biologic, it, it, you, you've got these molecules. And aspirin is, is a, a classic normal synthetic drug. We talk about aspirin being a molecule of about 24 atoms, or exactly 24 atoms. We know exactly what it looks like. We can picture it. We can draw it. Everything's fine. 
When you look at biologics, we're talking anywhere from 2,400 to 4,800 atoms. Hugely complex, three-dimensional protein structures that we cannot only not picture in a lot of cases, so it makes it really hard to fill out the sufficiency of um, description for a patent, but um, to try and copy that then becomes nigh on impossible. So what the originators do is they make these cells. They usually start with Chinese hamster ovary cells. They'll use yeast cells sometimes or different bacteria and modify them so that they produce the protein that they're wanting to get at the end. In doing so, there's a whole lot of processes involved. So there's a whole lot of information and there's a whole lot of technology involved in that, not only in the cell line, making them produce the protein they want, purification um, and delivery systems. We'll talk about that later on. But in the end, a biologic is never one molecule or never one simple thing. It's a micro-heterogeneous mixture of a whole lot of different compounds. It changes not only from batch to batch, but within a batch. It's not one thing. So if the originator has this micro-heterogeneous uh, compound, the challenges for a biosimilar are to try and reproduce something like that within the same boundaries. It's never going to be the same, can't be. And as you can see there, the Department of Health of Australia has said it's got to be a highly similar version of a reference biological medicine. EU has a, um, uh, sorry, the EMA has a similar sort of um, definition and so does the FDA in, in America. And they all talk about being highly similar. They cannot be the same. It's just impossible. I think that's enough about that. I think so too. Yeah. What have we got next? Um, so I guess in terms of this work and what we're, we're thinking about and, and working through at the moment is in making biosimilars, what is the information that's required and what information might be exchanged? And at, at the moment, we've got a, a fairly crude list, but it goes from the cell line itself, um, the uh, growth conditions, composition of matter, processes, use, formulation, delivery. Uh, you'll see that across most, most pharmaceutical patents or very similar across a range of pharmaceutical patents. And just to give you an idea, this uh, is an example. So Umvi's Humira is about to come off patent in the United States and there's lots of rumblings around biosimilars for, for, for it. Uh, there's discussions about which patent is the most important and there's negotiations and licensing going on between a number of companies. But at best estimates, Humira involves about 70, 70 patents. And what we're looking at is there are a couple of composition patents. There's 11 over the use, uh, 26 formulation patents, about nine process patents, and eight on the delivery devices themselves. So they're the sort of the scope of, of patents uh, over just that one example of a uh, biologic, so that's the original drug, and what might be developed later on will be the biosimilar, and that's where a lot of the, the, the litigation, a lot of disputes and fights with patents might arise in the next, the next couple of years. Uh, and we, we'll come back to that towards the conclusion when we're looking at the patent dance and what might be, might be uh, exchanged. But in essence, the, the patent dance is legislated in the US. So in 2009, the US introduced the Biologics Price Competition and Innovation Act. But essentially, it's, it's a, referred to the patent dance, but it's an exchange of information that commences when the biosimilar applicant shares its application with the originator. Uh, and what it does then is it continues with the exchange of list of patents and validity, uh, it talks about infringement and contentions around the validity of patents and in possible infringements of, of patents for the original and the biosimilar. Uh, and then it sets out the process around negotiations of the patents that might be litigated. And importantly, what it's trying to do is it's trying to uh, quicken the biosimilar to market, it's trying to make it easier um, for that biosimilar to uh, to get to market and ultimately reduce the cost of, of medicines for the government and, and perhaps uh, us as consumers or individuals. Importantly though, what it does is if those, if patents aren't listed, then the originator forfeits the right to bring litigation or to bring an infringement action against, against the party, so it's crucially important, uh, it was thought to be crucially important in this process uh, towards patent litigation. 
But there was a, an important case, uh, the US Supreme Court in 2017 uh, heard an appeal, and effectively what they decided was that this patent dance was, although thought to be mandatory, was voluntary. Okay, so the biosimilar company did not need to provide its, its um, information with its app, containing its application to the originator. Um, and what that ultimately means is there's lots of confusion and uncertainty around that exchange of information. Uh, and potentially it impacts on the development of biosimilars as the originators come off patent and we move to, move to market. And the scholars up there have, have written on this, so there's quite a bit written on the US patent dance, but what we've started to look at, or what Teddy started to look at, is the approach in Australia. And in the last couple of years, there have been a number of decisions handed down by the federal court that relate to slightly different aspects, but address some of these issues, and that's really going to be the focus of, of the work. So I'll hand back to Teddy, uh, who will just quickly go over some of those Australian decisions and what's been found. So the first case in Australia was in the, the federal court. It was Pfizer Island and Samsung Bioethics. It was over a product called Enbrel. Um, Samsung produced a biosimilar and um, it was deemed to be interchangeable. So that's the next level of biosimilar, if you like. So similar that they can interchange one with the other, even though they're not the same. They're similar, but so similar you can interchange them. So what Pfizer said was, well, if it's that close to our product and if these things are that intricate to make, you must have used our process. So they've applied to the court and said, we want the information from Samsung on how they make their product. Federal court, in the first instance, a single judge said, it actually became a, an argument about, um, um, what do you call it? Discovery. Yeah, discovery, that's it. So it was actually rule 7.23 in the um, federal court rules. So. While it didn't actually refer to the patents as such, it was about discovery of documents. But the judge at first instance said, well, you, no, it's actually got nothing to do with discovery. We don't need that. And just because it's very, very similar doesn't mean they use the same process. There's, there's a few examples out there where biosimilars have been made using different processes, but it doesn't mean that they have to use the same process. Uh, that was overturned on appeal, interestingly, sent back to the original judge um, that Samsung had to provide the information required. However, there was a, a, a bit to be done about confidentiality. So it all related to this information exchange on you've infringed my patent, no, I haven't, prove it. Who, who, you know, what information do you give and who do you give it to? Who instigates it? Who starts it? Interestingly, in the end, the information that was given is almost a parallel of the first two steps in the patent dance in the BPCIA. So you wonder then, is that legislative approach perhaps a better way to go? Hard to know. But there's a couple of other cases, um, Hoffman, LaRoche and Sandoz, very similar one, um, and they talked about uh, injunctive relief. Uh, a lot of the, the injunctive relief was argued whether a, a balance of convenience occurred. So that means if if the court makes a mistake and gives you an injunction, how do we assess damages later on? Or if we don't grant the injunction and it was valid, how do we, dam how do we calculate damages afterwards? So that seems to be the case around um, what's happening at the moment with us in Australia. You got the next bit? I think so. Well rehearsed. Well rehearsed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I guess what's really interesting, you know, this is a very narrow focus or, or topic, but in a lot of these discussions, there's some really interesting comments about the public interest and what the pharmaceutical companies are trying to do by getting this information. Uh, and there's, I guess, a bit of caution or scepticism from the, from the courts or the judges as to their motives for, for getting them. Because ostensibly it's about providing you know, a bit better access to medicines, cheaper medicines, um, but there's lots of, as I said, built within these you know, the procedural questions ultimately is lots of discussion around why that information needs to be, dis be shared, uh, the, who that might advantage and disadvantage, and ultimately whether it's going to have any effect on the, the consumers or the, the, the price of those, those pharmaceuticals. So there's, there's some really interesting questions that, that come out of those that we're still, still working our way through. Uh, and I guess this is our, our last slide, and really what we, we wanted to do here was launch into some questions at the end of the, end of the panel.
But really what we see in both of these approaches, whether it's the, the US legislative approach or, or the approach from the federal court in, in Australia, is there is a, an absence or lack of clarity in the area and it's more likely there's going to be lots of patent disputes over the next five to ten years or, or in the next decade. Um, probably more interestingly though, the focus of the information, the exchange of information is around the process or the, the manufacturing process. And arguably that is less important when we're talking about biosimilars and what the intent of, of biosimilars are and the focus of the federal government um, both in Australia and the US is, is trying to achieve. So I guess what some of the questions around that exchange of information um, are relate to the exposure of trade secrets. And there are provisions and, and aspects in both the, the US and the comments by the judges in, in Australia around confidential information. And what are you being forced to exchange in this patent dance? Uh, and if it discloses the process by which you make your, your, your pharmaceutical, then uh, that goes against one other aspect of IP that these companies are relying on heavily is trade secrets. So there's an overlap there, or inter, inter, uh, overlap with, with other aspects of, of intellectual property uh, law. Uh, and that comes out of, uh, Teddy and I uh, wrote a paper last year that looked at the challenge of getting a patent on biosimilars and ultimately it was very difficult or it's very difficult to get a, a patent on the, the composition or the product. So for cell, things like cell lines and growth conditions, the companies are relying on secrecy or, or confidential information to protect that work. Um, sure. Do I, do I need one? <laughs> no, I was just going to say, if... And, and the, the, the real point is, if the government's serious about getting biosimilars in to replace the biologics, they want them to be as similar as possible. In doing so, what they have to do is provide as much information about the processes that manufactured the originators. But in doing so, they're actually going against the originators. And it, it, it's this whole balance and this, this exchange of information that's really, really important. Um, and so there's been you know, some calls to to make the cell lines known, because they're not known. In, in the patent, they might say, I haven't seen one, but I presume it says something like Chinese hamster ovary cells, which is fine, but you haven't got the actual cell there. You've got to do a lot of work before you can actually make that drug out of there. So I, I think that's, that sort of stuff is, how similar do they want them to be? How serious are they about it? And how much information are they willing to sacrifice? Yeah, this ultimately goes to that question of what should be exchanged, and if we're talking about that, that you know, disclosing information, you get a, a limited monopoly, that the, the patent contract, then perhaps exchanging that process information or manufacturing information doesn't go to that, that contract. Um, but perhaps if there's an exchange of the cell lines, then that more easily meets that, that contract of disclosure and, and monopoly. Uh, and that's something that we're looking into at the moment is there has been some discussion about requiring the submission of uh, cell or the, the positive cell lines through regulation through either the FDA or the TGA. Um, but perhaps uh, it's possible to include that cell line as a deposit in the patent application. Um, so we're looking at some, some parallels there with other biological deposits under patent law at the moment. But probably the most important thing is not so much the process but it's what's being exchanged and perhaps for biosimilars the right information is not being exchanged under the current current approach. I think that's us.